Good morning. morning. Welcome to Christ Central Church. Uh, If you are visiting with us, we're especially glad that you're here. Um, We have several announcements this morning, so bear with me. Um, The nursery is available if you have a child in need from birth to preschool age. Our nursery area is located just outside the sanctuary doors, first hall on the left. Also, children in kindergarten through fifth grade are welcome to go out to Kids Central with Miss Laura once the worship music has concluded before the sermon. Kids Central is located right outside the sanctuary doors. Remember your donation items for the Kids Central Easter egg hunt. And this is Food Pantry Week. The truck will unload Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock a.m. and the distribution is on Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. The Wednesday meal this week is bring your own brown bag for after food pantry distribution. The church leadership team will be meeting following the morning service today. The meeting is open if anyone would like to sit in. Choir practice for the Easter concert is this afternoon at 4.44 p.m. and it's still not too late to come and join us. And we appreciate your faithfulness in making use of the offering plates available at each doorway. And now I'll turn the service over to David Creel for the ministry moment. While he's coming up, one correction, that's 9 o'clock on the food pantry truck, not 10. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just wanted to follow up with some things with the, the mission team. <clears throat> the, uh, the leadership of Christ Central Church has approved a plan to have TMS Global begin a missions mentoring process for our church. This mentoring program will help our church have a vibrant, alive, active and balanced approach to missions and outreach within our community and around the world. Before the mentoring can begin, the staff at TMS Global needs a better understanding of our current missions program and the congregation's perceptions of the, of the program and our outreach. And so to help them determine uh, the current state of things, they have formulated a questionnaire, a uh, assessment questionnaire, and this will be used to help our church. Uh, the the TMS Global will design a custom uh, program for us, a custom mentoring program <clears throat> based upon Uh, the assessment. This assessment is a questionnaire and it will be available on the church's website at ChristCentralChurch.org. It is also available in paper form out in the foyer, uh, just right out there on the table. And uh, it will also be emailed to everyone on the email, the church's email distribution list this week. And if you're not on that list and want to be, see Laura or anybody in the church office and they can get you included on that list. And the missions team would like to encourage everyone to fill out this questionnaire, this assessment, as soon as possible. The deadline is April 10, but please don't wait till April 10, especially with the paper copies. It'd be very helpful if we can get those back. If you're not planning to do it online, if you can do that as soon as possible, we need to mail those in. These will be confidential. It has a place for your name, but if you're doing it by paper, just seal it in the envelope and put it back in the basket there in the foyer. So again, the deadline for that is April 10, but please don't wait till April 10 to do that. Okay? Thank you. We'll be making announcements from time to time about this over the coming weeks. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Let's stand. Let's sing a little bit as we open up and worship. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever.
rising to the setting sun. His love endures forever, and by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. comes from Psalms uh, chapter 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though any army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on 
the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me at his sacred tent. I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in the straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the, the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I will remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord.
us. One day we will see face to face. Jesus, is there a greater vision of grace? In a moment we shall be changed. Yes, in a moment we shall be changed. In a moment we shall be changed. on this one, please. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Sing praise to
You may be seated. I am extremely proud of you. I, I got to tell you that. I was, I was thinking about all the things that could have happened in the last seven or eight months I've been here and all the things that did happen in the last seven or eight months I've been here. Um, everybody, give, everybody give Mike a quick hand here for a second. I'll tell you why in a second. Wells Fargo, after all of these battles, it's been seven months of battles, has finally decided to refinance our loan. And that's good news. That means we can pay it off a lot easier and a lot quicker. And I'm happy for that. Um, also, the thing that David was talking about this morning, missions, it, it ebbs and flows with all congregations. Sometimes with missions, we do really, really good, and then all of a sudden we kind of get burnt out and we kind of fade away. And, and that's normal for congregations to be in that hill and valley ebb and flow. And we got down to the, almost the ebb, and now we're creating a new thing to create the, the height of it again, to be back in mission strongly. I'm proud of you guys for accepting that, for doing that, for, for continuing to run the race. I'm so proud of you for so many things. When I asked at, at, the, at the beginning of the year for you to give a little more, you did it. I, my heart is filled with joy for you. You step up when you need to step up, and I'm grateful just to be a part of the congregation just to be a part of this church. We're coming into this second Sunday of Lent now. And what I wanted to talk to you about this morning was continuing to learn. And one of the things I want to talk to you about learning is that God keeps his promises. And, and that's going to be my basis for everything today is I want you to learn that God keeps his promises. So the reading is going to come from Genesis 15, 1 through 18, and I, I, I titled it, Look to the Skies. Um, we have to be careful and in, in not to continue in this Lenten journey in any type of spirit of discouragement, okay? This is a hopeful journey. It doesn't, it, discouragement is not part of it, although it's hard in today's life not to get discouraged now, now and then. But we'll, we'll take a lesson from Abraham and Sarah. They were discouraged uh, when God's promises took a little more time than what they expected. Uh, the signs of God's faithfulness, they're, they're all around us, by the way. If we would just but look, we will see them everywhere. More importantly, taking part in God's great promise may be the, the first step to believing God and having it be counted to us as righteousness. And of course, the best way to start into anything is to have a prayer. So if you would bow your heads and join your hearts with me. Psalm 91, 14 says this, Because they love me, says the Lord, I will rescue them, I will protect them, for they acknowledge my name. Everybody just take a moment and say, you don't have to say it loud, you can say it under your breath, you can say it to yourself, just say the name Jesus. Just say it. Teach us, Lord Jesus. As fear surrounds us, we pray you would stir up in us, hearts that desire to run to you. We pray for an unwavering trust in your goodness and in your promises. Thank you for your unfailing love, your unfailing grace, and your mercy over all of our lives. We pray the promises of Psalm 91 right now, that no harm would overtake us, that no disaster would come near us. We pray that your angels would guard us in all of our ways. We pray that because you love us, you will rescue us, you will protect us, and be with us in all of our troubles. Calm our fears, Lord, and bring your peace to our hearts, Father. In Jesus Christ's holy name, we pray. Amen. Once again, I said the reading is going to come from Genesis 15, 1 through 18. Look to the skies. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward, your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. 
Abram also said, Since you have given me no son, one who has been born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look towards the heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and the Lord credited it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. But he said, Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these things to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. And birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. Then God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve. And afterward, with possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the wrongdoing of the Amorite is not yet complete. Now it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, a smoking oven and a flaming torch appeared, which passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the Euphrates. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So what do you see when you look up towards the heavens? What, what do you see? I mean, do you see God? Or do you see the awesome majesty of the great creator. Do you see that? Or do you see like others see? A void which stretches across meaningless light years to encompass nothing. See, it's all in how we connect the dots, isn't it? That determines what we picture when we take a look at something. What we see. And different people see different things, don't they? You know, in the early days of the space race, you remember this? I, I remember living this. <laughs> now, the Soviet Union was officially an atheist nation. So regardless of whatever beliefs individual cosmonauts might have had, they were required to proclaim that God was missing in space and in history. Now, I didn't realize that when I was growing up. But now, as I look back, I see, you know... In August of 1961, Gehrman Tidoff, a 26-year-old at the time, uh, probably the youngest, it was the youngest one to reach space until about 2021. He spent a day orbiting the Earth. And he was only the second human at, time, at that time to do so. Now, upon his return, he paid tribute to the great giants of whose shoulders he stood. Describing his thoughts as he, he stood looking at the launch pad, Tidoff wrote about the gigantic efforts of will and thought of the great godless ones of the past, Archimedes, Copernicus, Galileo, and Bruno. He talked about these things, and he was even more explicit in his visit to the United States that next year in May of 1962, where he was quoted as saying, Sometimes people are saying that God is out there. He said, I was looking all around attentively all day, but I didn't find anybody there. I saw neither angels nor God. It was always, these kind of statements always throw me. Um, it throws me that people can, can look into, this, into space or see the stars or 
or, or even look into a forest of trees or the birth of a baby, and they don't see the creator in the creation. It just always throws me because it's been one of the things that's strengthened me through my whole life is to be able to see God in all things, in all of his creation. It's, it's always been something that's kept my faith just strong as I've walked through life, especially during times of disappointment or distraction or, or sadness. Now, C.S. Lewis was also alive during that time, and he was following the early days of the space race, and uh, he was interested in it with skepticism. He noted, the Russians, I'm told, report that they have not found God in outer space. On the other hand, a good many people in many different times and countries claim to have found God or been found by God right here on earth. Space travel really has nothing to do with this matter at all. To some, God is discoverable everywhere. Uh, to others, nowhere. Those who, who do not find him on earth are unlikely to find him in space either. You know? But, but send a saint up in a spaceship and he will find God in space as he found God on earth. Much depends on the eyes that are seen. Right? Much depends on that. So, it's probably more than ironic that since the breakup of the Soviet Union, space travelers from not only Russia, but America, Japan, Europe, must receive an official blessing, including the sprinkling of holy water, <laughs> as they prepare to fly into space aboard the Soyuz spacecraft. The Soyuz spacecrafts were, by the way, created by the Soviet space program. <laughs> And since 1960, these are the kind of crafts we've been using to go up into the space. But everybody that goes up is blessed and sprinkled with holy water. Isn't that interesting? In today's passage from Genesis, Abram, he, he's losing heart. Um, decades have passed since God made his original promise. God's original promise was to uh, him was, to your descendants I will give this land. And this was like out of the blue, God told this aging, childless couple to go on a journey that would include a seemingly impossible birth and end with their innumerable, des descendant, innumerable descendants taking possession of a great inheritance. It, it'd be like um, you're 75 years old and God says, you know what? I want you to pack everything up. You're going out of here. You're going to a place where you've never been before. And um, I'm going to give you a, another child. I'm going to give you a child on the way. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. I, you know, that would be a hard one. I can see why Sarah kind of giggled a little bit, you know. I, I can see why it would be. The journey had many twists and turns. The, their behavior, by the way, was not always commendable. Abram several times called Sarah, his, his sister, right? Not his, not his wife. Uh, but there are moments of triumph and deliverance. One of the most interesting things that Abram responded, uh, in the way that Abram responded, uh, was that he not only responded with obedience to God, but with silence. In other words, okay, God told me to do this, I'm just going to go do it. We trust him for it. Now, decades later, Abram finally talks back to God. And what he says is kind of challenging to God. He's saying, okay, you made me this promise, but, but I don't have any children. You know? He kind of challenges God. There's a, a poet and translator, his name's Robert Alter. Um, he notes that, like the prophets uh, who followed, Abram expresses doubt that God's promise can be realized. Now, Abram complains, Oh, Lord God, what will you give me for I continue childless? Uh, the, the Hebrew, it gets translated a little bit simpler than that. The, the way it's translated is, is Abram is saying, I am going, which is a euphemism for I'm going to die. And his, his thought is, I'm going to die without your promise being fulfilled. That's what he's saying to God. 
I'm going to die and I don't have any kids. You know, and God's response is, is not to argue, but he invites Abram to contemplate the majesty of the heavens. He tells him to look at the stars, to encounter the universe. God says, Abram, look up at the majesty of creation in the vast array of stars. And then Abram believed the Lord. Our passage says, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness because he trusted God. Now, oddly enough, the, the verse itself is quoted in both James and, and Paul quotes it too in the letters. They, it's interesting because they quote it from different perspectives. James, uh, the brother of Jesus, uh, for him, Abram was saved by his actions in obeying God, right? So it was about obedience to him. For Paul, the fact that Abram believed God before the law was given on Mount Sinai meant that his belief was an example of salvation by faith. One is works, the other is faith, right? Now, we, we both have battled with those two things, right? Uh, perhaps it's both. Perhaps we don't need to make a polarization or a distinction. Maybe it's both. Remember I told you about my, my friend, Dr. Randy Rowland, who was my mentor uh, when I got my first appointment? I told you he, had, he used to have a, he'd bring a coin in it. It had red on one side and yellow on the other. And he was talking to us about praying and working. And he said they're both the same coin, just two different sides. You must pray and work, right? And if you're working, you must pray, too. And faith and action are perhaps best understood the same way, as two sides of the same coin. If you believe, you act, right? If you act, you believe, right? But whether you know it or not, both has to be true, right? We can learn this. Uh, if, we, if, we ta if you ever really want to kind of compare, if you look at Genesis 15, 6 and James 2, 22 through 24, that same comparison happens, right? Or you can look at Romans 4, 3, 13 and compare it to Galatians 3, 6 through 7. As we continue, the scene gets even more mysterious. Abram takes part in a ritual in his dream. He, he is... He falls asleep, and it says it's a deep sleep, and it, it's, um, it's reminiscent of, of Daniel's experience in the exile, or, or Job when, he, when the architecture of the universe is revealed to him. They're kind of in a deep trance kind of sleep, and God is talking to them. And, and typically in these, the first thing you hear, the first words you read are, dread and awe typically accompany these visions. Uh, much as the, the fear and trembling Isaiah endured when he found himself in the presence of God's throne room. Dread and awe, I'm going to fall on my face and say, I am not worthy to be here. And now, future history was revealed, in, including both the enslavement of his descendants, along with their liberation and eventually arrival in the promised land. Now, we learn in God's time all of his promises will be fulfilled. Now, I have to emphasize a little point in there. In God's time, all things that he promises are fulfilled. My problem is, sometimes his timing doesn't fit my timing, and I get irritated and discouraged and frustrated, and, and then I do something foolish. I act without thinking or obeying or believing. And that's usually when I get in trouble and I end up back on my knees again, saying, well, that didn't work. What am I supposed to be doing? Oh, waiting on you. I get it, God. I get it. So let's take a moment with this. Have we learned in God's time all promises will be fulfilled? Have we learned that? And, and, and just think about it. And I'll move on. What promises are you expecting to be fulfilled? What are those promises? Now, the past couple of years, let's face it, they've been a roller coaster for all of us. 
But we believe, truthfully, as Christians, that ultimately, uh, in the Lord's Prayer, what we pray in it, that God's will shall be done on earth as it is in heaven. We, we believe this. We believe that it'll happen, right? Am I the only one? Shake your heads or something. Okay, good. Just want to kind of check. We do believe that that's going to happen. Yet sometimes, I, I swear it feels like we're in a whack-a-mole game and we're the moles. And we keep sticking our head up going, is everything okay yet? And, and lo and behold, whack! Right? <laughs> I mean, especially lately, it's, it seems like this is what's going on. <laughs> The pandemic surges, it fades, it surges again. Political strife reigns over the entire earth right now. And, and though Jesus fervently prayed that we might all be one, our churches are struggling to maintain any type of harmony or unity. We seem isolated from each other at times. So I'm going to ask the question again. I want it to really sink in. I want you to spend the week thinking about it. Have we learned yet that in God's time, all promises will be fulfilled? Have we learned it? Has it sunk in? In the midst of any discouragement we may feel, we need to remember that some of God's promises to Abraham were not fulfilled for centuries. Right? Long after the patriarch was gone. In a world of television and music on demand, overnight deliveries, instant gratification, we tend to lose heart when we don't get what we want right now. And that is where I make my biggest mistakes. Because I want it done now and I want it done. And sometimes I've pushed, even, even people who have been saying, Mark, wait, chill push them right into something that's wrong, you know. So I'm going to be careful this year. I, I think it's, it's, it's important that, remember, that we remember that one of the spiritual fruits is patience. I think it's important we remember that, to be patient, right? Still, we can't help but ask, how much longer, Lord, how much longer? You know, am I the only one that asks that question sometimes? How much longer? You know, it is an essential question asked throughout Scripture. Job, the psalmist, Habakkuk, uh, God's people in exile all wondered how long they would have to wait for God's will to be done on earth as it, in, as it is in heaven. All of us have, have pondered the question. So we're not the first ones to struggle through this or ask the question. Uh, during this time of Lent, we would do well to focus not on the discouragements or the lack of everything getting done in our time frame, but if we would take the time to focus on the cross, things will seem easier, better. We will get stronger. Now, it, it wouldn't hurt to maybe stand outside on a clear night and look up at the heavens, see the stars and their true glory. And also remember, God's glory is visible not only in the stars, but in our families, in our friends, even our, our furry little friends that are part of our family. God is there. And if we look with eyes of faith, we who believe in God will see the cross everywhere. We'll see the grace of God just covering all of humanity. We'll see that happen. Anyone who's seen a birth or a shooting star, or I, I always remember this because I spent three years in Alaska, and I remember I was in the infantry, so we would be out, you know, trudging through the tundra at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I used to just be in awe of the Aurora Borealis. I mean, I, I can't tell you, you've seen it probably in pictures, but sometimes you see this green thing across the sky or this white thing across the sky. I have literally seen God painting with his fingers and all colors that were so bright and magnificent, I can't even express to you what it looked like. It looked like something that was computer-generated, 
But I've seen him wipe his finger across the star and red just glow, you know, or purple just glow. You know, I, I can't say anything but to attest to the faith and fulfillment that comes with being a part of God's magnificent creation and seeing it and seeing him in it. All who worry about their children's future know what it means to be connected to unseen descendants. We worry about our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our great-great-grandchildren. Have we left them anything? Is there anything we could do to leave it better? You know, we won't be uh, the ones who receive either the blessing or the curse from whatever decisions we make on this earth today. They will be. You know, I'm hoping, I'm praying that we make good decisions, that we guide them and lead them in the right direction. We who are disciples of Jesus Christ should see the cross and our own personal redemption everywhere. Everywhere. We especially should see it in our children and our children's children and their children and make sure they see it too. We certainly see it in the skies in each other. We even see it in our suffering. We see it in our triumph. And in the crosses that each of us carry, we see it. We see His grace. And with a faith and a hope that spans centuries, let us also look for the resurrection and the peace that passes all understanding in every aspect of our life as disciples of Jesus Christ. This is something I want you to ponder this week. Where do you see God? How do you see Him? So once again, I'll ask the question. Have we learned in God's time all promises will be fulfilled? I, I do pray that the answer is a resounding yes. I hope we've learned that. And let's learn to, to look for God in all of his creation, to see uh, God everywhere and believe his promises will come true. This is what I'm hoping for today. May that be so. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May we stand, please. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Thank you, Eddie. You're in the home.
sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. I had forgotten we were walking Friday and talking about life and things, you know. And I look up, and I saw something that is, is rare to see. It was an American bald eagle. It was unbelievable. I mean, it, it just, you know, the yellow beak, the, the white, oh, just was, and, and both of us were in awe of God's creation at the time. We were in awe of it. I just kind of wanted to mention that to you. Um, I'm going to leave you again with Matthew 6, 14 through 15. I want you to keep it there. Uh, For if you forgive others their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, uh, nurturing your hurt and anger with the result that interferes with your relationship with God, then your Father will not forgive you your trespasses. This is what I pray for you. I pray that you are patient that you're kind, that you're willing to forgive and understand other people, that you carry Jesus with you in every moment of your life and everywhere you go, and that you share him with others. I pray this for you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Don't forget, leaders, we're meeting here in just a few minutes. And be nice to anybody who's just now coming in for church.